In the previous lecture, we talked about DNA. Let's talk about the next in line, RNA, and the respective genetic code. The genetic code is listed as the bases required from RNA to create the specific amino acids in line to create proteins. So let's go into some basics here. The central dogma of biology states that DNA will flow into RNA, which will go into proteins. Note that there are violations of the central dogma, in particular retroviruses, which go from RNA to DNA first, so hence going against the central dogma. However, most biological systems and biological organisms will operate under the central dogma most of the time. It's a degenerate code, which means that it allows multiple codons to encode for the same amino acid. Note that a codon is a three-letter sequence, and, and each three-letter sequence is going to correspond to a respective amino acid. Take note that you don't have to have those memorized, though. What you do need to have memorized are the initiation codon, which is AUG, and the termination codons, which are listed as UGA, UA, and WAG. Generally, that's how I remember them. There are some mutations when it comes to the genetic code, but there is a decent amount of resistance in the fact that these amino acids are synthesized using codons. For starters, there's redundancy. Most biological functions are coded for by multiple genes, therefore allowing one gene to be faulty and still allowing for proper function. The fact that you have three bases that create one amino acid also allows for a third base wobble position. This third a, a genetic base often does not alter the codon's role which is why when you look, the three-letter codes for each respective amino acid differ at the third base, but the first two often are the same. A point mutation is noted as a mutation that affects one or a very small amount of nucleotides, and there are three types in particular. Silent ones have no effect on the protein synthesis. This often, is done, this often happens at the wobble position. Nonsense mutations create premature stop codons. If you remember the stop codons, they are UGA, Ua, uag. UGA, UAA, UAG. Missense mutations are codons that code for different amino acids. Obviously, this can create different protein functions. Note that mutations happen naturally over time as well, which can lead to speciation or other sorts of effects. Frame shift mutations result, are the result of a nucleotide that is added or deleted. Since these are read in three letter codons, Deleting or adding a nucleotide is going to change this reading frame, and the subsequent codons read are going to alter. So if I were to have six amino acids, and I'll just put them out like so, if I were to delete this one, instead of having a reading frame starting, oh, let's say I had a reading frame here, if this is deleted, then the new reading frame is going to change. So instead of AUA, it's going to read AUG, and this is obviously going to create changes in the subsequent codons read. These are the two types of mutation that you often see when it comes to reading the genetic code in future translation. RNA is single-stranded and it contains uracil instead of thymine. It also has a ribose sugar instead of deoxy sugar, which is noted in DNA. If you remember from the previous lecture, there is cut the pie, and pure as gold and GIC three words. That's a good way to remember the distinctions. At the right is a picture of RNA and just for fun I had the Spanish, Spanish names for all the bases. There are three types of RNA in particular. There's messenger RNA, mRNA, which carries messages from DNA to the cytoplasm for translation. Transfer RNA brings in the amino acids and reads the codons on the mRNA. Transfer RNA and its respective coding is often called the second genetic code next to DNA because although the genetic code can be proper, if the tRNA cannot properly bring in the correct amino acid per codon, you're still going to have issues. Ribosomal RNA, rRNA, is what makes the ribosome itself, which is going to be what synthesizes the protein. Transcription is very similar to the replication of DNA. However, it, rep it creates RNA instead of a DNA. Note that it's going to be semi-conservative either time. The replication complex has helicase and topoisomerase, much like with DNA replication. However, instead of DNA polymerase, you have RNA polymerase, which binds to the Tata box in the gene's promoter region and thus has a subsequent replica uh, replication. HNRNA is what is synthesized from this DNA template. After you 
After transcription, there are several modifications before the HNRNA can go out into the cytoplasm for translation. For starters, there has to be a 7-methyl guanylate triphosphate cap added to the 5' prime head, or a, simply a 5' prime cap, and a polyadenosyl tail, or a poly-A tail, added to the 3' prime end. This is, this is used as a tag to signify to the nucleus that an HNRNA is ready for export. SNRNA and SNRNP, or SNR, SNRPs as I like to call them, comprise the spliceosome, which removes introns using a lariat structure. What happens is we have introns and exons, exons which exit and introns that stay in the nucleus. A DNA will have HNRNA is going to come out like so, and what's going to happen is it's going to fold on itself in a lariat. So if I have two positions here, the spliceosome are going to bring these together into one spot like that and then cut it off. So what you're often going to see is either one side or the other side is going to be the exons. This is another way that the cell will regulate which genes are expressed. Where these are spliced and where these are cut can allow for multiple different types of genes to come out of the same sequence. Which brings us to the next one. Polycystronic genes are present in prokaryotic organisms and they code for multiple products through varying transcription starting points. So if I've got a sequence if I start here and go, it's going to create a different, um, a different product than if I were to start here or even here. So depending on the starting point, you can create different expression patterns. And lastly, alternate splicing. This is present in eukaryotic organisms only. This is a variation in exon combination to yield different products. So an example of this is if I were to have something like so. So if I were to have one intron here and one intron here and maybe two exons like that. If I cut this one out, it's going to create a different sequence. So if I were to cut this one, you would have three exons and one like this. However, I could potentially cut this one also, leaving something different. So as you can see, depending on where the cut occurs, this is going to create a different sequence for translation. This, is, this form of alternative splicing is again another way that we can create different protein products from the same sequence of DNA. Now that we've covered transcription, let's go into the second portion of the protein synthesis, which is translation. This occurs in the ribosome. And if you remember, ribosomes are comprised of rRNA and other proteins that are involved in the subsequent protein synthesis. Below is a diagram of the ribosome. tRNA is what translates these codons into the correct, correct amino acid. Therefore, tRNA is what actually goes into the ribosome and adds the protein respectively. What you'll notice is that there are three sites. There is the E, the P, and the A site. And we'll go into what each site does when we talk about the steps of translation in the later, in, later on in this lecture. Speaking of which, let's go into those stages. The first stage is the initiation of said translation. The ribosome connects to the shine dalgarno sequence for the prokaryotes, and it will attach the 5' prime cap for eukaryotes. Remember that prokaryotes don't have these sorts of post-transcriptional modifications. After it attaches to these sequences, or the 5' prime cap, it'll scan for the start codon. Once it finds the start codon, then the initiation factors will associate with the ribosome and therefore start translation. Elongation is a three-step cycle that is repeated for each amino acid added to the protein after the initiator. During elongation, the ribosome moves into the 5 to 3 prime direction along the mRNA, synthesizing the proteins from N to C terminus. The ribosome contains three binding sites. The A site holds the incoming amino acyl tRNA complex. This is the next amino acid that is being added to the growing chain and is determined by the mRNA codon within the A site. The P site holds the tRNA that carries the growing polypeptide chain. It is also where the first amino acid, methionine, binds because it starts the polypeptide chain. A peptide bond is formed as the polypeptide passes from the, the tRNA in the P site to the A site. This is done by the enzyme peptidyl transferase.
Lastly, the E site is where the now inactivated uncharged tRNA pauses transiently before exiting the ribosome. As the now uncharged tRNA enters the E site, it quickly unbinds from the mRNA and is ready to be recharged for later use. So, if you look, remember from the previous slide, it's listed like so, EPA. I often think about just the Environmental Protection Agency. That's how I remember it. But how it's going to proceed is down the line like so. Often, the way I remember this is that A is the first letter of the alphabet, which is where it starts, and E is where it exits. After translation occurs, there are different modifications that happen to the newly formed protein. For starters, it has to be folded, and sometimes it's going to be assisted by chaperone proteins to get into the proper configuration. Also, quaternary structures can form as well, which is, if you remember from previous lectures, a quaternary structure is when multiple proteins will combine together to form a more complex structure. These proteins can also be cleaved or have signal sequences added to them. And lastly, there's covalent addition to other molecules before the protein is considered complete. How do we control gene expression in prokaryotes, though? There's two types that we'll go into. The first type of system we'll go into is the inducible system. This is normally bound by a repressor under normal conditions, and it's turned on by an inducer, which will pull the repressor off the said operator site. An example of this is the lac operon. Bacteria generally prefer not to synthesize lactase because it's more difficult and they'll prefer to use glucose. However, when lactose is present in large quantity, it's going to bind to these repressors and pull it off, therefore allowing for the synthesis of the lactase enzyme. So to draw this off, if we've got a given sequence, there's going to be the regulating region, which I will just abbreviate as REG, the promoter, which is where RNA polymerase is going to want to bind to to synthesize, and then the operator. And then the rest of it is just going to be the subsequent gene. The regulator is going to synthesize a repressor. And this subsequent repressor is going to bind to a site at the operator like so. However, in the presence of, in this case, lactose, this is going to bind to the regulator thus inhibiting its function, which means that this binding is not going to occur. If that happens, then RNA polymerase is going to hit this site, and this gene is going to be transcribed, allowing for the formation of lactase. The next type of system we'll go into is the repressor system. This is transcribed under normal conditions. However, it's turned off by a co-repressor that's coupled with the repressor. This is going to bind to the operator site and repress expression. So the inducible system, if you remember, is not transcribed under normal conditions, but can be induced to transcribe, whereas the repressible system is transcribed, however, can be set to repress if the conditions match. The classic example for this is the trip operon. So again, let's draw out that structure. So we've got a regulator, which I'll again abbreviate REG, the promoter site, which is where RNA polymerase is going to want to bind, and then the operator. And again, there will be a little site here for a specific protein to bind, and then the given structure of the gene itself. The regulator, again, is going to create some sort of repressor. However, the repressor can't bind the operator itself unless there is a co-repressor present. So if we've got a repressor, we have a co-repressor here. If these bind, then it's going to create the proper binding protein, which is then going to bind to the operator site. If this occurs, then the gene is shut off, meaning that it's not transcribed. Therefore, RNA polymerase will not be able to proceed, and transcription will stop. The classic example, trip operon, responds to tryptophan. If there is an excess of tryptophan present, then the, then the cell will stop synthesizing its own, therefore repressing its gene expression. We've talked about how prokaryotes manage and regulate gene expression, so let's go into eukaryotes next. There are multiple ways, but for starters, in eukaryotic systems, these types of complexes or replication complexes are going to search for promoters or enhancing regions of DNA. 
promoters are close to the transcription start site, meaning that this is where the, structure, the replication structure is going to bind to, and then it's going to slide towards the transcription site and begin its respective transcription. Enhancers are further away from the transcription site, but what they do is these are several elements that are grouped and allow for the control of one's gene's expression. Enhancers are called enhancers because they can increase the synthesis or decrease the synthesis if they're inhibited. There are different ways to modify chromatin structure to also alter expression. Histone acetylation is going to acetylate the histones and therefore decrease their affinity for DNA. This is obviously going to allow DNA to loosen up around the histones and thus increase accessibility to the DNA. DNA methylation, on the other hand, decreases the accessibility of DNA because it methylates the DNA and binds it in more tightly into the histones. We'll finish our discussion there. In the next lecture, we're going to start going into the biological membrane. And the last little portion of our series is going to be talking about metabolism in general. We'll see you in the next couple.